This is the Integration Podcast. You might call this a variety show due to the fact that there will be no limitation on what I choose to discuss. However, all of my episodes will have one central theme, integration. Integration is a fundamental aspect of knowledge. Knowledge isn't just a random assortment of facts. In order to understand something, we must know its characteristics and utilities. In addition, we must know how it is related to other things. And most things are related to other things because individual aspects do not exist in a vacuum. In the following episodes, I'm going to talk about philosophy, economics, politics, art, culture, science, and its many subordinate categories such as metaphysics, ethics, epistemology, finance, human action, regulation, elections, movies, music, social justice, social status, and more. Hello, everybody. Thank you for joining me on the Integrating Podcast. So, there's a few things that I want to talk about. Think of this initial episode as the orientation to the Integrating or Integration Podcast. I haven't decided which name I'm going to go with, Integrating or Integration. There's a few podcasts on the internet already named integration podcast. I haven't seen any that are named integrating, although I know there's really no major copyright. You can't copyright titles, but I still want to be able to differentiate my podcast from the other ones. Um, I haven't figured out which one sounds better, so by the time this is uploaded, perhaps I will decide between integration or integrating. Without further ado, let's get started. So think of this episode as the orientation podcast. Um, This podcast will have a structure to it. The things that I want to talk about today on this podcast are... I want to talk about why I chose the name Integrating or Integration. Because the title is going to sum up basically what the podcast is about it's it's definitely going to play a major influence anyway thematically that is not necessarily genre wise so i'm not the name of my podcast doesn't limit me thematically or genre wise the podcast name however does imply that i need to have some sort of structure which will present its own set of challenges, as well as not having a specific niche, but there's a cost-to-benefit analysis that I did. There are pros to not having such a niche podcast, but in a way it is niche for reasons that perhaps I will explain. I'm still working it out in my head as, as I talk to you about how it's going to play out. Um, I'm going through several different iterations in my mind, and I'm coming up with several different ideas, and it's various thoughts are fighting for the front of my brain right now. So that is presenting, again, its own set of challenges. So, once more, uh, one of the things I'm going to cover in this episode is why I chose the name Integrating or Integration, which, as I stated earlier, I will pick one. Also... Um, there's a specific fundamental philosophy or ideology or way of thinking that influenced why I chose the name, which I will again talk about, but I'll talk about whether or not I consider myself a part of this movement or whether I have any major disagreements or agreements with them. I'm going to talk about what this podcast will not be which will help, again, differentiate it and help you establish what this podcast is going to be. 
uh, I'm going to talk about how this podcast will relate to several different things, such as economics, politics, and media. And I'm also going to talk about what my goals aren't. So right off the bat, I want to talk about why I chose the name Integrating or Integration. And it really started with my journey into objectivism. And I will elaborate why. So I would say I was introduced to Ayn Rand my senior year in high school. Mm, yeah, senior year in high school. More specifically, I, I, I don't know if I would say I was introduced to Ayn Rand because conceptually I wasn't aware of who Ayn Rand was as a purpose, but I was introduced to her work. Senior year. And required reading for senior year English class was Anthem. So I read that, and, you know, it... it like, I, I liked the book, I thought it was entertaining, but it didn't spark an intellectual journey, as you might put it, at all. But more recently, as I've discovered people like, well, this is, this was a few years ago, but I started getting into libertarianism. I had sort of a, a political um, a transformation I started at one end of the spectrum, or maybe I was haphazardly floating in what some would call the center, or fence sitters, and I, I took bits and pieces from different different things that I heard. I was thinking only pragmatically, meaning only circumstantially. <clears throat> Therefore, I didn't really have any principles, and I thought that that was the correct way to view the world. I was also introduced to Ron Paul. I'm sort of, I'm taking a really long time to get to the point. I apologize. Let me try to state it succinctly. So I was introduced to Ayn Rand senior year through the book Anthem in senior English class. Before that, sophomore year, I'd say I was introduced to Ron Paul. It might have been freshman year and sophomore year I was introduced to Ron Paul via his 2012 presidential candidacy. That kind of faded away because obviously he didn't make it, Mitt Romney was the Republican nominee, and I, again, I wasn't uh, contemplating conceptual ideas politically, philosophically, economically, or any of that. I was, I was drifting. I was wandering around like a zombie. So I graduate high school, or senior year, I start you know, waking up to the things around me, because now I have to make big decisions. I need to decide what I'm going to do, so what are d different obstacles that are going to be in my way? And there's many obstacles, of course, many of them being political, many of them being economic, many of them being social, many of them being my own lack of planning and my own lack of action prior to me deciding I want to take a big step forward. Regardless, um, I started becoming more politically oriented. I discover John Stossel, who is a libertarian, kind of like Ron Paul, but they're two different camps of libertarianism, although there's a lot of overlap. They don't necessarily dislike each other. Ron Paul's a fan of John Stossel. John Stossel is a fan of Ron Paul. Regardless, I started watching Stossel. I started watching the episodes that people had uploaded on YouTube. And I became a libertarian. Via John Stossel, I was introduced to Yaron Brook. And I started listening to Yaron Brook. And there was kind of a period where I was listening to many different libertarian thinkers. So Ron Paul, I started reading Murray Rothbard, I started listening to David Smith and whatnot. But I wasn't going to push away people like Yaron Brook because for the most part they were saying stuff that I thought was interesting. Eventually, I discovered that one of my favorite actors from one of my favorite, probably low-quality or trashier TV shows, uh, primetime TV shows, Mark Pellegrino, who played Lucifer in Supernatural, turns out he's an objectivist. 
I heard him talk about it, and he has a way of sort of getting out the message that I really appreciate of ideas of liberty. And I think he eloquently advocates for Randian ideas. I discovered Rucka Rucka Ali and started listening to his channel Rucka Reacts. And keep in mind, I am already predisposed to ideas around liberty, individualism, capitalism, and so on. So I decided, okay, these people are advocating this specific philosophy, so I decided, okay, I'm going to reread Anthem, and I did, and I finished that really quick because it's a short book. Just recent, no, well, not too long ago, I started reading Atlas Shrugged. That's a really long book. I'm only a quarter of the way through. I like to read more than one book at a time, unless it's uh, college required, then I will, you know, dive into the book and finish it and take notes on it. But other than that, when it comes to my reading habits, I divide my reading time between two to four different books at a time. That way I don't get bored. I have ADHD. That's its own thing. Regardless, I started reading For the New Intellectual by Ayn Rand. And I started reading uh, Philosophy. Who needs it? Prior to this, though, I'm jumping ahead, not too far ahead. So as I started reading uh, these books, I made a few videos documenting my journey into objectivism. My thoughts before anything related to objectivism was video number one, my initial thoughts going in. Video two was after reading Anthem. I made a video about the things that I drew from it philosophically, politically, and just thematically in general. Um... And I'm still working on the third one. I'm going to do it on Atlas Shrugged once I get through it. Again, it's a big, big book. And it's a <laughs> it's a long book, so it's going to take me a while to read it. Because, especially since I'm not putting all my concentration into just reading that. So, the main thing I want to talk about here today is Philosophy Who Needs It, which is a collection of articles, essays, and speeches written and given by Ayn Rand talking about... You know, philosophy, how it should be applied, and its importance. So, what inspired me was this one paragraph that I read in just the introduction to Philosophy Who Needs It, which had a profound impact on me. And here's the thing, is the person who wrote this introduction was not Ayn Rand, because Philosophy Who Needs It wasn't compiled by Ayn Rand. It was something that she wanted to work on, and she had, I guess, a general outline, according to Leonard Peikoff, who is one of her most loyal students and one of her most favorite, I would say. Finished the project, compiled it, and everything that... He, he declares everything that is written in Philosophy Who Needs It is entirely Ayn Rand's opinions, and uh, there's very few edits, and the edits that there are do not impact negatively what Ayn Rand was trying to say. So this is just the introduction to philosophy who needs it. This isn't getting deep into her writing just yet. So I have a feeling I'm going to be even more impacted. But so, but the, this paragraph in the introduction, I'll read it. Reason functions by integrating perceptual data into concepts. This process Ayn Rand holds ultimately requires the widest integrations, those which give man knowledge of the universe, in which he acts, of his means of knowledge, and of his proper values. So my major takeaway from that is that c connecting facts is something I innately knew, but never quite articulated into, into thought or never thought to articulate at all. I mean, this is something that I inherently knew when learning stuff because I'd integrate facts. And I strongly liked this idea of integration because, well, it, it makes sense just based on this. The world isn't a set of individual facts with no relationship to each other. And in an analogy that I would say perfectly sums this up as far as integrating goes is let's take fire we understand fire as a concept alone 
something, this, this is a noun. This isn't nouns in plural or a plural of a noun. This is a specific noun. This is a concept. This is a thing. This is fire. So what are certain qualities of fire when we perceive it? Well, we see that it lights up. It's a source of light. It allows you to see farther distances. So you can use it as a means of illumination. But there's other things that you perceive. You perceive that there's warmth to it. So it could warm you up. Now, how do you make this thing a fire? How do you make fire? Well, there's several different ways. They all sort of center around the idea of heat. And there's different ways you can generate heat from uh, chemistry, from chemical reactions, to friction, and uh, just various, to dryness, various other things. There's certain ways you can generate heat, and there's certain fuels that can fuel a fire. So knowing, just creating this fire, which is a singular concept, requires integration because you have to know these several different things that seemingly, if, if you don't understand the concept of integration, they're separate from one another. But they're not. They're related, and together they can create something. However, you can further divide up fire into different subcategories of its utilities and of, of what it is or how to use it. So, obviously, it can be used as a source of light. But also, it can be used to cook food, to... We, we take warmth and warmth, and how can we apply warmth, warmth to a way that's useful? Well, you can cook food to have it taste better, because, you know, maybe cooked food tastes better than raw food. But more importantly, we can take this idea of warmth, we could use it to keep us from dying from cold weather, we can use it to melt ice and into water or we could use heat as a way to sanitize things boil water you cook food to kill anything that might be potentially harmful whether it be a bacteria or some sort of parasitic organism organism that is the way i understand i understand that when i'm thinking of integration because there's many things that you have to integrate to create a fire. And this is just a... Don't... I don't want this to be the only representation of objectivism. I don't want you to think that I'm advocating for objectivism. Which will bring me into my next topic. Is do I consider myself an objectivist? So let me make it crystal clear. I am still learning about objectivism. So I'm not here to peddle objectivism. I'm not here to sell it as the answer to everything or the most perfect ideology or philosophy to ever exist. And it's not because... So do I consider myself an objectivist? Ultimately, no. And it's not because I, I have any major disagreements with it. Because from, you know, based on what I understand, I'm still attempting to understand it if that makes sense. And if I apply an adjective or declare myself a specific a noun which is associated with certain ideas, I want to make sure I know exactly what it is. So I don't look stupid, I don't bastardize something. So with me talking about integration, maybe Ayn Rand or Leonard Peikoff or any other objectivist thinker or advocate or philosopher Maybe the way they would describe it is completely different from the way I'm describing it as I understand. Again, this is just me going into it and taking something out and having a revelation, something articulated, which should have been so obvious, but wasn't obvious for whatever reason. Either maybe I'm stupid, maybe the education system failed me, Maybe I didn't take the effort to look for personal edification, autodidactic learning outside of formal, government-run schools. I don't know. Probably, probably some amalgamation of all of it. Regardless, that, that's one thing. And I also don't want to murk, make the water murky 
So we can't clearly look at objectivism, or you can't clearly look at objectivism. If I misrepresent it, I want to make sure that I don't misrepresent it for you, and then you make a decision about how you feel about objectivism based on what I said. So, therefore, I'm not going to claim I am something that I am not. Maybe down the line, I will find more things I disagree with objectivism about. Maybe down the line, I will entirely adopt the philosophy of objectivism or fall somewhere in between. So, with that being said, I explained why I chose the name of objectivism or uh, integration, integrating, and I talked about what inspired it, which has connection to objectivism. Sorry about all the background noise, by the way. And it's time for me to go into the part of the podcast where I explain what this podcast won't be. So I know I talked a lot of about objectivism, which ultimately has a lot to do with philosophy. But I want to make one thing clear. This podcast will not be a strictly philosophical podcast. I don't even necessarily have the intention of talking about philosophy at all. I have the intention of talking about things that interest me. And it just so happens that philosophy is one of those things currently that is interesting me. So although I will not shy, I mean, although this podcast isn't strictly about philosophy, I will not shy away from talking about and exploring philosophy. I'm going to talk about what I want to talk about. I'll pursue in this podcast, you know, personal edification and, of course, pleasure. I want to throw my ideas out into the world, kind of like a boomerang, and see if my ideas change become more informed and evolve when they come back to me. And ultimately, basically I'm seeking a more integrated mind. But not only well I I want to make sure that I add a sort of addendum to it to make sure that you know what I mean by an integrated mind. The concept of integrating your mind is in my opinion a very positive one trying to connect things, and it's definitely a good critical thinking exercise, trying to integrate things, but I'm not simply trying to integrate things just so I can make analogies or have some sort of like philosophical rambling in a Jordan Peterson style. I want the integration to to be as accurate as possible. I want the information I integrate in my mind to reflect reality. So there is that aspect, as well as this being a critical thinking exercise, an intellectual exercise. I'm not claiming to be an intellectual. I am far, far, far from it. So let me just talk to you real quickly about things that really interest me that you can really expect me to talk about. So I would say that my interests are the things that I am studying include tech. That's number one, because that's actually what I'm studying for school. I'm pursuing a bachelor's in computer science, and I'm going to probably later on uh, have a, a, side or a side sort of minor in electronics and stuff like that. So I, I'm also currently using my information to pursue IT certificates. So technology is probably one of my biggest passions. One thing I'm really excited for and that I want to talk about later on is probably what Elon Musk is doing with Neuralink, the brain machine interface. To me, that is super exciting stuff and I want to talk about because going into it there's two extreme sides of it and I'm not saying that one of them's right one of them's wrong and I'm not saying that anywhere between is wrong Uh, to talk about that more thoroughly I will need to do a completely different episode but there's obviously two sides to it and you could see this idea in stuff like eugenics as well or um, DNA manipulation 
So, you get those people who are completely against it because they think of the movie Gattaca, and then there's people who are totally for it because they're ultimately transhumanism. To me, I'm not transhumanist. I don't think we need to excel beyond being a human. I think we need to be the best human being that we can possibly be. And if that comes to curing or alleviating the major disabilities of being, uh, you know, major mishaps of human DNA in order to cure autoimmune diseases, terrible accidents that affect, you know, your spinal cord or anything like that. I think that's what it means to be the best human being possible. Whether this is digitally via Neuralink and what Elon Musk is working on, you know, this sort of, uh, I'd say, integration of human beings and, and computers and artificial intelligence, or whether it's the more biological route via um, DNA manipulation, CRISPR type stuff. I realize when I say type stuff, it makes me sound like I don't know what I'm talking about. It's because these ideas are bigger than me, that's why. So that's my main focus, though. That's something I'm really excited about. Um, an another thing, these are two different things that I am autodidactically studying. And that is philosophy, because I've really gotten into it. And I'd say, thanks to Ayn Rand, she's given me... Reading her so far has given me the urge to get into philosophy. And I'm not going to just read her philosophy. I'm going to read various other philosophers. Ones that she recommends or ones that she gives uh, praise to or that objectivists give praise to. And of course philosophers who they completely disagree with. Because I want to strengthen, again, my knowledge. And maybe Iron Man will come out you know, as the superior philosopher. And I'm predisposed to ideas of liberty as it is, so maybe it's likely that she will be my preferred philosopher, preferred person to read. Secondly, I have a huge interest in economics. I very frequently frequent the Mises Institute website and read their articles. And I listen to the lectures on the Mises, you know, or yeah, the Mises YouTube channel. I am completely a f huge fan of Ron Paul, Murray Rothbard, Ludwig von Mises, all people again who are associated with the Mises Institute in Austrian economics. Of course, when we're talking about economics, to me, I think business is a subcategory of economics. Maybe I'm wrong. I know economics is a social science. A social science and an education. Business is considered business. It's a business school. So I know there's separation. But to me, I really strongly link economics and business. I think accountants will have a much better understanding of economics than Keynesian economists who study Keynesian economics in, in college. Regardless, those are my <coughs> three, but if you put them into subcategories in the way I just did, four main interests that I'm currently studying, and only one of them formally, which is tech. So let me talk about my intellectual influences. Right now, if I had to say what my intellectual influences are, and... There's some overlap, but there's also some major, major disagreement. Of course, my intellectual influences have the potential to change. So maybe every anniversary, I plan on doing this podcast for a long time. Every anniversary, I'll talk about who my intellectual influences are now and compare it to this episode. My intellectual influences would have to be Ron Paul, Louis von Mises, Sam Harris, which is entirely different from everybody I've named, and of course, Ayn Rand. And there's specific reasons for that. And people who I admire would be, who I don't consider intellectual influences, but these are people who I admire and I really, really like their body of work. And maybe they have a place <coughs> on my list of intellectual influences. So, Euron Brook, 
Gina Gorland, Michael Malice, Marie Rothbard, John Stossel. And there's probably some I'm missing. This isn't a comprehensive list. Um, so how will this podcast relate to politics? Well, ultimately, <laughs> um, politics controls every aspect of your life. So if there's any sort of subcategory of philosophy or, you know, some sort of social science that I think is the perfect epitome of integration, it would be politics. Simply being because politics controls every aspect of your life. It has an influence, whether or not it directly controls, but it has an influence in the markets that you advertise yourself in or purchase from. It influences income. Uh, the most basic one that people like to throw out is, is roads. It influences personal relationships, future planning, the media you enjoy, the way your brain is shaped, via government run education, government ran education. And I don't mean this to say that politics is the one all be all because philosophy and other ideas do have an impact on the way people vote. And of course, the motivation of politics is based in a lot of, I'd say, philosophical ideas or lack of philosophical ideas. <clears throat> so with that being said, how will this podcast relate to f something like economics? Well, I mean, the way you make money, business, taxes, regulation, innovation, incentives, that's how politics will relate to economics, that's how this podcast will integrate politics and economics and of course your individual life. What about media, movies, music, video games, internet, etc.? Well, there's often times where there are th there's themes that writers and artists are trying to get across when they're telling a medium that has the potential to tell a story. So, what is the author trying to say? Is it culturally, politically relevant? Are they, is there art, propaganda? Is it a reaction to current events? Is it, has it, is it not a reaction to current events, but is it more a product of the way current events have shaped them? Has current events shaped the way they see the world, the way they want to get out their message? Has it shaped what they want to talk about in a specific piece of art? <clears throat> um, and... Is me going into these elements useful when I'm talking about, you know, integration? Will it be a useful thing to talk about on this podcast? And I think yes. I think <clears throat> earlier when I was talking about uh, the transhumanist type movement, I mentioned how people... I mentioned it very vaguely, so if you don't remember it, that's okay. I mentioned how people, when they hear something like eugenics, they think of Gattaca which is a movie about, you know, ba basically, as some people would put it, designer babies. People think of that. Now, do I think that that's necessarily a bad thing? No. Do I understand why people would be afraid of uh, what they would describe as eugenics? Yes. Yes, I do. And do I understand why people would be skeptical of computer brain integration? Or interfaces like Neuralink. Yeah, I understand that too. And it's not like I think those criticisms are unwarranted. I think their criticisms are warranted. And I think it's a healthy debate about where we should go as a species. 
especially when we become technologically capable to manipulate DNA and, of course, um, uh, interface, integrate, embed uh, computers into human beings or have some sort of merger or enhance humans via technology. Those are serious conversations, and I do see the movie Gattaca, which to me is a good movie. It does have a theme that's very important. I think you can extract a meaning from it. You can take that concrete movie, and you can extract lessons and themes. And I think those lessons and those themes are important. <clears throat> I do think that movie is, it, there is a lesson that you can take from that. It is a cautionary tale of where things can go. Classism exists, elitism based on any hierarchical structure exists, and it probably will always exist. So we, ha we do have to be careful about that. So I do think f in this, for, for that reason, as I think I laid out clearly enough, is that, yes, looking at media, <clears throat> whether it be movies, musics, music, video games, or the way news influences us, is extremely important. So I have a show on this channel called Movie Libertas, and in that I, I go more in depth into movies thematically so this isn't going to be strictly about movies there might be some redundancy if i mention themes or a movie that i talked about before on movie libertas but this podcast is more of a variety type so it's not going to be movie libertas but if analyzing movies thematically is something that you are interested in or analyzing you know, what went on behind the scenes of a movie, which influenced the way the movie came out, therefore influencing how the movie flows narratively, therefore influencing its themes. If that's something that you are interested in, then go ahead and check out Movie Libertas. It's a young series. It's going to take a lot of time for me to write, record, and edit episodes for that because it does take a lot of work. Also, does a question that I'm pondering is, does philosophy, politics, and ideas affect the way we, we view and enjoy media? So, I'm looking at it from the other end of art creation. What about art enjoyment? Or media, again, or I guess I'll declare this for the first time, doesn't just include art. It can include journalism. Because, well, that's broadcasted through some of the same means that our entertainment is broadcasted through. So these are there's a lot of ideas there that I can extract different sub meanings for or that I can connect all together. <clears throat> and talking about this podcast, talking about these ideas, I am not trying to be pretentious. I'm not trying to seem like what I'm saying or what I'm doing is more important than what anybody else is doing. I'm not trying to declare myself as some sort of intellectual or philosophical or philosopher king. That's not what I'm doing. I'm not claiming to be a genius. I'm not claiming, claiming to be somebody that you should listen to. Here's what I'm trying to do. Mo f f mostly. Do I have an agenda? Yeah, maybe I want people to think the way that I think. I think if we are being honest with ourselves, even those of us who consider ourselves so open-minded, we typically want people to think the way we think. If you're if you go and claim, "Oh, I'm open-minded." There's a, there's if you think about it hard enough, I guarantee there's a button there. I'm open-minded, but other people aren't. Or, I think other people should be as open-minded as I am. Or, I came to this conclusion because I'm not closed-minded. 
wrong. So, and if you were open-minded, you would come to this conclusion too. Almost everybody I've heard that has claimed to be open-minded, and this is a little tangent phrase, everybody who I, again, who I have met who has claimed to be open-minded, they aren't very open-minded. You have people who ponder ideas more than others, but that doesn't mean that their mind is changed, even if they ponder ideas that are counter to theirs, or that thoroughly dismantle their ideas. So again, I am not trying to be pretentious when it comes to this podcast. What I am trying to do is exercise my critical thinking skills. Because I think it will have a much more positive impact on my continuing education for my career. I think it will have a positive impact for me to identify social cues. Which again will help influence me maybe having better friendships, closer relationships with family members, or a much more meaningful romantic life. I want to become more open to immersion of stories, art, and ideas, and I think trying to integrate different themes, and really trying to understand what an author, a filmmaker, an artist is trying to convey is one of those ways, and then understanding its relevancy in the current world that it is in. I want to improve upon my intelligence, and I think really, really exercising my critical thinking skills and, you know, taking in more information that I can potentially integrate is going to improve my intelligence. Maybe. Maybe maybe it won't. But there is one thing about intelligence is that when you relate new information to other information, you remember better. So I think in that specific capacity... I think it will, or in in that sense, it will increase my intelligence capacity or my capacity of knowledge. I want to become more integrated. I think, again, as I stated before, that is a net benefit more than it is any net negative. But ultimately, I want to put an emphasis on this. I want to have fun. And to me, taking something like media seriously, taking economics, politics, philosophy, ideas seriously, and thinking about them, and and throwing them out there for other people to hear them and counter it, to me that's fun. I enjoy doing that. It's how I found out I've been wrong about many things before. It is a wake-up call, and I realized that I wasn't as integrated as I was before. There were things that I was wrong about. I wasn't as smart as I thought I was. And finding that out, to me, is fun. I would say the bulk of what I probably consume on YouTube are two people having a full-on conversation about something filled with disagreement. So I hope this served as a useful orientation to this podcast. I hope I painted a clear picture for you to understand what I'm trying to get at. If anybody is out there listening. Regardless, it's still means for me to talk out my ideas out loud and still take all the benefit that I'm seeking from this anyway. It'll be interesting to see probably how this will look a hundred episodes from now. A year from now. Three hundred episodes from now. Whatever sort of parameter I want to put on it. Or a benchmark. How I want, depending on how I want to benchmark it. Thank you for listening.